Well, first of all, thanks for taking the time to talk with me today. I know your schedule's busy and I appreciate it. But first, you know, just tell me a little bit about yourself. So everyone uh, who doesn't know you gets to know you a little bit better. Sure. Well, I have been working in the learning and development field for over 25 years, and I like to say I've done all the jobs. So I've done everything from, I mean, my very first one I claimed, Dwayne, was a crew trainer at McDonald's. And that I had McDonald's got me for into lunch. The, so there you go. The legacy continues. <laughs> well, that was my first. And then after that, I did all the, the training coordinator, LMS administrator, design, facilitation, all the things up until more my last role was when I was the vice president of learning for an employee benefits company so all the way up to that that level and now I'm out on my own I'm a consultant and I work with L&D leaders and teams to help them to be more strategic more intentional and work with measurable impact so that's what I like to focus on now I live in the Phoenix Arizona area we moved here about two years ago from North Dakota so we traded snow for sunshine fantastic and i am obsessed with coffee and silly socks so there you go <laughs> you and i uh, i think are made from the same cloth yeah because i love coffee and um my uh, my socks that i'm gonna wear tonight have bomb pops on them Perfect. so yeah Perfect. so it's 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 very very similar and i love the phoenix area and i love north dakota although the last time i was in north dakota i was in fargo that was where we were what I found is the, the folks at the VFW in Fargo are very friendly and they're very inviting and I had a good time there. I really thought Fargo was an underrated town. So I, wow. I enjoyed my time up there. So I'm, I'm curious if you don't mind talking a little bit, tell me about how you made that transition from the corporate trainer position to being out on your own. I know we, I want to talk about what you wrote on LinkedIn and what they republished. Sure. Because measurement's important. But I yeah. last week we had Tony Sanders on and we talked a bit about how he made the transition from mm -hmm. working to being a consultant. And I don't mm -hmm. want to spend the whole hour on it, but tell me about, were you scared going into this? Were you ready? Was it just something that you're like, let's do this? How'd you make that transition? You know, I always had a vision that towards the latter part of my career, I would go out on my own and do consulting. So I knew that would happen. I think I did not know it would happen now. Um, I had been in that vice president role and then the company that I was working for was acquired. And so that meant some shifting of what my job looked like and how I was going to do the work. And I started looking elsewhere, applying other places and nothing just seemed like it was going to be the fit for me, if you will. Um, and so after a little bit more soul searching, I thought, maybe it's time. Why not now? I didn't just go cold turkey. I did have an exit strategy of how I was going to leave my corporate role and go out on my own. My strategy was that I would work with some smaller consulting agencies as a subcontractor first and then build my business, which were, was a good idea in theory. However, doing the subcontracting, the roles were great. I met great people. It was fun. But I didn't have time to build my own business outside of that. It was taken up all my bandwidth. So I did pivot recently to pull back from after my last subcontract gig was over, pull back from that. So this has been a little over a year that I've been out on my own. And I wouldn't say that I was scared. However, I do have many, many days where I feel like I have a new job and no one to train me in. Mm. So I'm learn you're learning as you go, which I think is the great fallacy of adulthood. I remember as a kid thinking, oh, grownups have it all figured out. No, no. <laughs> no. We're just doing our best to figure it out every day, just like everyone else. So No, you're yes. absolutely right. There was a great, um, a great meme I saw the years ago that really changed my perspective on that. And uh, it said... It said, kid, you know, look back on your childhood and the mistakes your parents made and remember that while you were growing up, they were growing up too. Mm, I love that. And as being a father, I look at that and go, yeah, so many times. I, I, I said to my dad one time, you know, as I fix things around the house, the kids will sit and watch me. And he's like, yeah. And I said, they'll sit and watch me the way that I sit and watch you. And I'd see you under that sink and I'd think, how does he know all these things? 
<laughs> and now as I lay there into that sink, I realize you didn't, you didn't know what you were doing. <laughs> we and, were just, we're all just trying to get along. Exactly. And he didn't have YouTube to help him. Right, right. So that's, <laughs> that's the key. You know, how do I do this? Well, there's a video out there to help me. Exactly. So one thing that uh, I want to, I want to get to your article, great article. Um, I thought at, you know, the, the, the way you looked at measurement is, is fantastic because there are so many people who look at measurement as just a pain. I don't want to do it. Frankly, I don't know how to do it and uh, I've got better things to do. So let's talk about what you've written here. And, and I'm reading from the article. I've noticed a trend in the way those of us in these areas, human resources, learning and development, training, we th you've noticed a trend in how we think about measurement and you think we've got it all wrong. First of all, tell me about the trend that you're seeing and then tell me how we've got it all wrong. So I think the trend is basically what you just hit on, Dwayne. You know, we didn't go into this profession to run numbers. That's not why any of us started this job. And so it's not the strong suit of people who work in these people development professions. And that tied with this time that we're in where resources are tight. You know, mm -hmm. we have to do more with less. And those who are making the decisions about where to allocate the resources in any and all organizations need good data in order to make those decisions. So stay with me for a minute. Where I'm going with this is they're looking at the data. So when I say the people who are making the decisions about where to allocate the resources, I'm mainly talking about the C-suite level at this point. So they're looking at how do we know that we have we have this much income, this much revenue, and this many expenses. And we can't live in debt forever. And now we know we need to cut back because of the financial times that we're in. And so how do we make the decisions about where to pull back our resources and where we allocate more resources, if you will, in order to help our business continue to run effectively? So learning and development typically is seen, often can be seen as a cost center. So we can see that we are easily, ex we, can, we can feel like we're easily expendable. So when you, and, when you talk about it being seen as a cost center, mm -hmm. um, help, I want to make sure I understand what you mean. What, what I've said to folks and what I think I see from a lot of management is that management tends to see training as an expense, not an investment. Correct. Okay. Yes. And we aren't typically the area of the company that's bringing the revenue in. True. So we know, I mean, I think in our hearts, the reason we do this work is because we know that, that it adds value and it helps people to do their jobs better, which in turn helps the organization to be better, all of that. But without the data to show that that's happening, it's just a story from us. And so those who are in the C-suite and who are making decisions don't make decisions based on stories, if you will. Um, they're looking at metrics, they're looking at measurement, they're asking every or every part of the company to complete a QBR, a quarterly business report, or some other kind of reporting to show performance metrics, you know, revenue in, expenses out, that kind of thing. And so those of us in learning and development now have been, have started to be asked to do the similar type of thing. And we don't know how. And so with this pressure that we have from above that is tied to the resources that we may get or the resources that may be pulled away from us and the ask that in order to make those decisions <clears throat> in order to make those decisions we need some data to back up that what you're doing is making a difference in the organization and with our own feeling of we don't know how to do this it sort of creates this panic within us or this overwhelm mm -hmm. and then that isn't a good place to be mentally when we're trying to think logically so when we're, when we're in this mode of what I call prove it, so when we're in the mode of the reason I need to, cre to complete and turn in these metrics and measures to the greater organization, the C-suite, whomever it is, is because I need to prove to them that I deserve this job or I need to prove to them that I'm worth the expense. We don't think logically. We're coming at it from an emotional angle. And so that causes us more panic than it does productivity. And that's the mistake I think that we're making. We need to shift our thinking 
and not come at it from this place of overwhelm and panic, but instead we need to come at it the same way that the C-suite is coming at it, which is the reason why we measure, the reason why we are looking at measures is so that we can make good business decisions. We need to look at it from an L&D perspective as the reason why we are measuring and why we are providing metrics is so that we and others can make good business decisions, not to prove our existence. And then we come at it, it just shifts our whole thinking. We come at it from a much more logical standpoint and we're looking at it in a different way. When we had uh, Jim Kirkpatrick on the show, we talked yeah. about Kirkpatrick model. And mm -hmm. we, we discussed the fact that each model or each level has mm -hmm. its purpose, right? It level one, did they enjoy it? Well, if they're not enjoying a training, they're probably not going to move to level two. Did they learn anything? And if they don't learn anything and you can't go to level three, did they apply it? A lot of the times measurement stops at level two, though, doesn't it? And it's yeah, difficult, it sure does. It's difficult to justify your existence, which is basically what we're we're talking about. The C-suite comes to you and says, justify your existence. What are you how are you making the business better? How are you increasing revenues? What are you doing for the business? And if you just look and say, well, they they had a good time. <laughs> That's difficult to, to justify. Is that, is, is that where we're going? Is that what you're talking about? Well, sort of, but I'm not even talking about justifying our existence at this point. Because okay. I think if we are measuring so that we can make good business decisions, not just for the sole purpose of justifying our existence, then once we start looking at it that way and we start gathering data in that way, we don't need to justify our existence anymore. Because if we're doing it right, and if we are, I believe you're right, we need to get past that level too. If we are doing that, then it's obvious. It's obvious the value that we're bringing. Um, I like to think of, so I take the Kirkpatrick model. I do use that one. That's, that's the one that I, I have used throughout my lifetime. But I also look at it um, when we're measuring, I like to think about it in terms of three different buckets of measurements that we need. And I didn't make these up. They came from the book Measurement Demystified by Peggy Parsky and David Vance. Okay. Um, so the three buckets are activity measures, effectiveness measures, and outcome measures. And they correlate to the Kirkpatrick model. So activity measures are the how much, how many, how often. It's measuring the activity that we're doing. And this... Um, it, it, it can include level one, you know, if, if they enjoyed it, but I think that might actually fall into effectiveness. But activity measures are oftentimes what is easiest for us to report. So I can report um, how many people clicked on and enrolled in my course. I can report on how many hours it took to create a course. I can report on um, how many people participated in our courses and or how much it costs for them to participate over time. Those are all kind of activity measures. When I first do, started doing measurement, when I was first asked to provide a QBR, we didn't have anything. And this was many years ago. And so I pulled together what I thought I could and I had all activity measures for the most part. I think there was one effectiveness measure. And my boss, who is the best boss I've ever had, looked at it and said, this is great. This tells me that you're busy. Everyone is busy. What are you busy for? Like, what's the purpose of your busyness? So we need to report on more than just activity measures. However, the activity measures will tell us, in terms of business decisions, things like um, what content is being accessed most often. So that tells us that then, and what content isn't being accessed. So now we can make a decision about, do we keep the content that isn't being accessed? Is it worth it for us to spend time and money maintaining that? time and resources versus if things are being clicked on often, now we can dive into that. Why might that be? Should, do we need to amp that up a little bit? Is it, is this something we need to add more information to? So there's the activity measures can inform our work, but we can't stop there. And I think oftentimes we do. Effectiveness measures is more levels three and four. So that's, did we learn something and did behavior shift? And we need those measures for our programs as well. Outcome measures is that, I'm sorry, effectiveness is levels two and three. <laughs> Outcome measures is level four. That's the, did we move the needle? 
Where I think we sometimes get tripped up is we think we need an outcome measure for everything. I don't believe we do. I think we need an outcome measure for the things that are strategic initiatives for the business. So we need to show that we're impacting the strategic moves, the strategic initiatives for the business, the biggest rocks, if you will, because our outcome measures always take the most time and effort to gather and report on. We can get activity and effectiveness measures a little bit more easily. So um, sometimes I think we get overwhelmed because we think we need to show the impact on every single thing back to the business. I don't think we do. I think we just need to focus on our outcome measures for the biggest rocks. And so those are, when I built a measurement strategy overall, what I'm looking for is do we have all three of those measures in play? Are our outcome measures aligned to our largest strategic initiatives? For our day-to-day -day activities, do we have activity measures and do we have effectiveness measures? So I'm looking at all of those when I design any type of a strategy. I really like the idea of, of not having outcome measures for every single thing. And because when mm -hmm. we start to thinking about business impact, there's a, I'm reading a book called Brave New Work. And they oh, talk yeah. about the fact, great, great book so far. Mm -hmm. It talks about the fact that you may have to get manager approval for a $500 expense, but anybody in the business can schedule an hour long meeting for 25 people. And you start looking at the way things costs and you start weighing how much cost is going into measuring an outcome on something that isn't key versus the, the, the opportunity cost and the expense moving that towards measuring something that we may not be measuring, but is, is integral to the, to the business. I like that idea. Yeah. It, and it also takes a little bit of the pressure off because I think we try, we, we all, the other thing we as L and D does, and I think it's partly because we don't really understand measurement a lot of times is we overcomplicate it. And so we think, oh, we need an outcome measure for everything. Well, to your point in the example you just gave, you're not, you don't need to report the outcome measure for the meeting, if you will. Mm -hmm. But do I need to report the outcome measure for how I've helped an, a, a section of the business to become more efficient? Because maybe efficiency is in our strategic initiatives to become more efficient, more automated, whatever it is. How would you help someone find out what those, what those specific things are? How, how does a person go about finding what they should be putting outcome measures on? Yeah, I love that. Well, first of all, you need to know what the strategic initiatives are of the business. It always starts there. What is the business starting trying to achieve? What are they, what is our, I shouldn't say even the business, I should say our business, because one of the mistakes we make in L&D is we think of ourselves as a support function, but we are part, a valid part of the business. And we need to shift our own thinking to think in our business. We are working together in partnership with the greater business. So in our business, what are we trying to achieve? What are those big major initiatives this year? And once I know what they are, what's the three-year plan, the five-year plan? Now I can start to drill down to how can the act of learning and development or the work of learning and development, how can we partner with the business to assist in, to be part of, um, attaining those initiatives, whatever that looks like. So it always has to start there. I always recommend starting with the, the measures that already exist. So we, I think, also get stuck because we think we have to make up all the measures ourselves. But for example, if I'm working with a contact center um, and they're having some performance issues and they know they need to get more automated and more efficient, I'm going to first look at what are the measures that they're collecting to tell them that they're not efficient right now. So some of the things even are in the questions we ask in the beginning of a project, if you will. I'm asking um, not just what are the learning outcomes that you're helping to achieve. We're really good at asking that. We need to ask some different questions. So the, the contact center comes to me and says, we need to be more efficient. I'm going to say, well, how do you know you're not efficient right now? What's telling you that you're not efficient? So that's the question that I'm already looking for and hunting and pecking for what are the measures that already exist. And now we're going to see, we're going to tie to those measures as best we can. And when we do come up with our strategy and our intervention and our potential solution, now we're going to, we have a benchmark from before and an after to see if we move the needle. I like so that question. Starting... How do you, I'm sorry. No, I like that ahead. question. Just... How do you know you're not being efficient? Because yeah. I think that can also help you identify times when training's not the answer. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely it can, because that's many times. Another question, another one I hear, I hear frequently, especially when we're working with onboarding new employees. So when we're with, and I tend to work with companies that are growing very quickly and they've just gotten to this point where they need a little bit more structure or processes or something in place. And so onboarding is huge for them. Um, a big thing is we need to get people up to speed faster. Well, how long does it take you to get people up to speed now? is the question to ask. Or we need less involvement. It's taking too much burden from our supervisors and our managers whenever we have to onboard a new person. Well, what is the burden it's taking? How can you quantify that? Um, when we put those, we can pull those measures first, then we can know if we've moved the needle on the, on the outset. And then that's a, that's, a, that's a measure that we can hold up and say, this is what our work did. Our work saved. Um, our work reduced the manager time for a, a new hire. And this was with one program that I did work with. We were able to reduce the time, ramp time for a new, for a supervisor working with a new hire. We decreased their amount of time they needed to spend with that new hire by 70%. 70%. Now, whenever you can get to that measure, now you can correlate it to dollars because the salary of that, per, that supervisor, now we have saved that amount of money, that 70%. And so it became very easy for us to show the amount of expense that we had saved the company over time with some of the programs that we did. But we did got there by asking different questions on the outside. When you talk about asking questions, I'm curious who you ask questions to. And the, and the reason for that is I, I remember working with some folks and I was like, well, how are you measuring this? And they said, well, we're measuring X and we're measuring Y and we're measuring Z. And I said, how do you know that's what the folks care about? How do you know that that's what the mm -hmm. ultimate deciders care about? The people who are sitting there with your, you know, holding your purse, holding your funding, how do you know they care about those things? How do you know, that, how important is it talking to that C-suite and where do you stop searching before you start measuring? Yeah, I don't know that it's always the C-suite that drills down to that number. Um, sometimes it is, but oftentimes it's the individual department or team leaders or managers, and it's what performance are they measuring. So the C-suite is often looking at the overall. They're looking at the bigger picture. But when we as L&D are working with an individual area or team, we're, we're not looking at the – we want it to tie into the overall picture. So that's important that it ties with the overall business initiatives. But if the business is – organized and functioning effectively, those overall business measures have been defined first, and then each individual area and team is working to figure out how they're going to, how they're going to meet those, how they're going to um, contribute to the overall strategic initiatives. So I'm working with our individual stakeholders, and I'm asking them, what measures are you reporting? So how do you know for example, how do you, what are you already measuring? How do you know that somebody is doing a good job on your team? How do you know that somebody isn't doing a good job on your team? How do you know who you're going to promote or give a raise? Those are some of the questions I usually start with. Um, and likewise to the, the project, if the goal is to be more efficient, how do we know we're inefficient right now? And those measures are, de are defined usually in the independent, in the in the individual department or team by that manager or leader because that's what they're reporting up, if you will. So I know I've hit the right mark if those people are the ones who are responsible and they're under the pressure to provide those particular measures, if you will. So we've got a, just a few minutes left in the podcast and I want to give okay. you the opportunity. I'm looking at your LinkedIn page and I find myself on LinkedIn more and more and more these days. And I see on your LinkedIn page, L&D Must Change Podcast. Yes. You're doing a podcast too. Yeah. Tell me about that. <laughs> yeah. So I really think there's a lot of ways that in our profession, we need to shift how we think. And if we can shift how we think and shift how we approach our work, we can eventually have a broader change across our entire industry. L&D Must Change is two things. It is a newsletter and it's a podcast. The newsletter drops every other week, and that is my voice. 
The podcast drops on alternate weeks, and that is the voices of others. Because I can't be the only one who's telling the story. I have one, I have one perspective, but it's going to take all of us to make this shift happen. And so in the L&D Must Change podcast, I'm talking to people who also are looking for small ways to shift our industry, if you will, and have us start to think or act a little bit differently. If you could, I didn't prep you for this question. I just thought of it right now. But okay, if you could change one thing in L&D right now, what would be your, your priority? Yeah, my priority is that we in L&D act like the business and we understand the business. We give ourselves a pass all too often on understanding how the business functions, how any, any business functions, and we also sabotage our own selves by doing things like what I mentioned before when we say we think of ourselves as a support function, not an important part of the business. And if we start to do that, that's number one mindset shift. Now we're going to start to act like the rest of the business where we're thinking strategically. We're operating strategically. We're not knee-jerk reaction to the flavor of the month strategy that comes up from whichever leader squeals the loudest about needing some assistance. It's a very strategic move instead. So um, it's intentional in that it's a mindset shift and it's strategic in the way that we approach the, the work. And it is aligned entirely with the business and we understand and operate as the business. If outside of, of uh, LinkedIn mm -hmm. and your, your newsletter, where can people get a hold of you? Because I'm, I'm hoping people hear this and they're like, I want, I believe we must change also. How can I sign up for your newsletter? How can I subscribe to the podcast? Yeah. How can I get in touch with you? Well, the number one way is through LinkedIn and that is where I start most of my interactions. So um, follow me on LinkedIn. You can subscribe to the newsletter. It is a newsletter that comes out through LinkedIn, and then you'll get the regular updates on that as well. So, if, and message me through LinkedIn. That's the best way to get in touch with me. That's what I did, and here we are today. So <laughs> You did, and it worked. Thanks again for taking the time to talk with me. This has been great. I will put uh, a link to the article that we talked about today in the description of the podcast. So you can all go and check it out. And uh, follow Jess on LinkedIn. Learn from her. And uh, as Bob Pike used to say, Jess, I'm going to charge you with the same thing, you know, add value, make a difference. And I, I see that you're doing that every day. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Thanks, Dwayne. It was great to talk with you.